Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello everyone, this is Dr. Bhanu Priya Rohila from Mohanlal Sukharia University, Udaipur. Today's lecture deals with the poem Ode to the West Wind, which is a very celebrated poem by Percy Bysshe Shelley. The poem is a part of the fourth unit of the paper, British Romantic Literature, as per the UGC CBCS syllabus run by Utkal University for semester 3 of BA English Honours. This lecture is being recorded for the third phase of the DTH Swayam Prabha program and this is the 10th lecture of this syllabus. Before we begin with the poem, I wish to remind you here that the poet Percy Bysshe Shelley, we have uh, already discussed briefly in the first unit and the detailed introduction of the poet will be done in the next lecture with the poem To a Skylark. Both the poems are odes and as we have already learnt that odes were written to commemorate an event, an individual or an occasion, here this ode celebrates an abstract entity that is the West Wind. Just like other odes, this ode also has an elaborate stanza structure with lofty language. Earliest odes were written to praise the feats of kings and players. Shelley the child of revolution here sings of the west wind and incarnates the object of nature in a divine form and renders it the faculty of omnipotence and eternal divinity. He makes it the root cause of every change in nature that creates new life by destroying the already decayed elements. So, to put it simply, we can say that the poet worships West Wind as God and believes it to be responsible for death and decay. However, this death and decay is welcomed by him as he believes that this brings rebirth and rejuvenation after it. 
The poem is believed to have been written in Florence, Italy in 1819. Now, let's read the poem. O wild west wind, thou breath of autumn's being, thou from whose unseen presence the leaves dead are driven like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing. Yellow and black and pale and hectic red. Pestilence stricken multitudes, O thou, who cherishest to their dark wintry bed. The winged seeds where they lie cold and low, each like a corpse within its grave until thine azure sister of the spring shall blow. Her clarion over the dreaming earth and fill driving sweet buds like flocks to feed in air with living hues and odors plain and hill. Wild spirit, which art moving everywhere, destroyer and preserver, hear, O oh, hear. So Shelley here begins with an invocation and an apostrophe, that is an address to the west wind. And in a metaphoric expression, he terms the west wind as the breath of autumn's being. That is autumn's life essence. So he, he uh, creates a perfect personification of autumn as a person and the west wind as the breath of that person. So we can see here that the west wind with the capital W suggests personification but Shali here gives it a divine persona and not the persona of an ordinary person. He further addresses the west wind as an unseen presence that drives away the dead leaves. This rendering as an unseen presence gives west wind the characteristic of being felt by the movement of the leaves since the wind as a physical characteristic is invisible. The unseen presence equates the west wind with the divine as well. The metaphor is supported by a simile when the poet compares the manner in which the dead leaves are driven away with ghosts fleeing away at the sight of an enchanter. Yellow, black, pale and hectic red. These are the withered colors of the leaves which are personified as the pestilence stricken multitudes. So pestilence is any fatal disease that spreads as epidemic. And here this pestilence is the disease of plague. So just like the coronavirus, plague also spread as a pandemic in 17th and 18th century in England. Thus, here the poet compares the colors of the leaves with such ailing people. And the leaves represent the sick and the half-dead humankind. The poet describes that all the different colored leaves or symbolically or morally, uh, spiritually dead humankind is driven away at the sight of the west wind that represents some revolutionary power. That is, this west wind has the revolutionary power that has the capacity to destruct the sickening faculties in an object. The address continues as the poet talks to the west wind 
and says that you are the power or wings of the seeds which takes or chariots them to their uh, to their dark wintry bed there uh, they that is the seeds are low and cold and they are they each in their cells the whole visual image is aligned to the cycle of seasons and their relation to vegetation as in the late autumn west wind drives seeds to different places where they are covered under snow in the winter and with the arrival of spring they come out in the form of plants so this is the imagery as the poet aptly describes in next line until thine azure sister spring shall blow her clarion so here again the poet through an effective metaphor and personification calls the west wind and spring the sisters the phrase over the dreaming earth also intensifies the effect of earlier word images that the seeds lie cold and low in the wintry bed dreaming earth also represents the slow activity of the nature during winters the season and vegetation metaphor still continues with the poet describing the growing plants and buds of different hues and fragrances filling up the air across the plains and hills the personification of buds as sheep who feed on air is instantaneously palpable that is it can be felt now the poet terms the west wind as wild spirit which is moving everywhere both these expressions that is a spirit and its presence everywhere speaks to us that uh, the poet considers west wind as a divine unseen presence which is omnipresent so the first stanza ends with the line destroyer and preserver here o oh, here this summarizes that the west wind as the poet believes and have spoken to us is both the preserver since it supports and protects what has the potential of life like the seeds and at the same time it destroys what has lost on the sap of life and has entered decay like the dead withered leaves the last words of the poet have been spoken as a worshipper who prays the all powerful god to hear his prayers in stanza 2 the poet describes the impact of the west wind in the atmosphere which reads as thou on whose stream mid the steep skies commotion loose clouds like earth's decaying leaves are shed shook from the tangled boughs of heaven and ocean angels of rain and lightning there are spread on the blue surface of th- of thine airy surge like the bright hair uplifted from the head or some fears menad even from the dim verge of the horizon to the zenith's height the locks of the approaching storm thou dirge of the dying year to which this closing night will be the dome of a vast sepulcher vaulted with all thy 
congregated might of vapors from whose solid atmosphere black rain and fire and hail will burst over here so addressing the west wind shelly now explicates that in the stretch of the west wind and in its stride that partakes the expanse of the high sky there is a commotion amid which loose clouds are shed and they are shed like earth's decaying leaves and the clouds are shed from the tangled boughs of heaven and ocean so this extended metaphor of boughs of heaven and ocean refers to the system of water cycle and its mixing with the cycles of season the imaginary tree whose roots are in in ocean and branches are tangling in the high sky has the leaves that are clouds water evaporates from the sea and turns into clouds these clouds are suddenly compared with the differently colored withered leaves which are moved by the movement of the west wind these clouds which are the angels or messengers of rain and lightning are spread on the blue surface of the airy surge of the rise of the wind here the visual impact has the colorless images uh, of the unseen air which can be felt only by its sheer power of movement and its impact from the surface of the ocean to the steep heights of the sky these clouds are now compared to the bright hair uplifted from the head of some fierce menad so who or what is menad so in greek mythology menads were the wild intoxicated females who used to wander in forests and mountains performing frenzied dances they were the worshippers of bacchus bacchus the god of wine so menads used to live in wilderness and Uh, they remained isolated with their wild intoxicated minds devoted to bacchus the hair uplifted or the clouds spread everywhere with the power of the west wind and the brightness of the flashing light of the eyes in the background gives the reader uh, the picture of the coming all permeating storm these messengers are spread from the dim verge of the horizon to the heights of the zenith so this is the expanse zenith is the highest peak of the sky or the point above the person or the observer in the sky so these messengers are everywhere in every direction and they deliver the message of the approaching storm this west wind in this stormy night of the autumn becomes the dirge or the funeral song of the dying year so funeral songs are sung when somebody dies and this die this sings of the year and here it's sky here it uh, it describes here the uh, the poet describes the sky of uh the approaching dark and stormy night as the dome of the vast sepulcher which is the earth here sepulcher is the burial domes under this dark dome the congregated might of vapors that is the vapor collected uh, from the from the clouds is depicted as solid atmosphere 
that is the mass of the clouds will burst into black rain, fire and hail. The poet has used the oxymoron like solid atmosphere to create the impact of powerful stormy fiery hail and rain. The image of the earth as the vast sepulchre and dark sky as its dome is so predominating that it leaves nothing to create further. So now let's uh, move on to the third stanza that reads as Thou who didst waken from his summer dreams the blue Mediterranean where he lay lulled by the coil of his crystalline streams beside a pumis isle in Baya's bay and saw in sleep old palaces and towers quivering within the waves intenser day all overgrown with azure moss and flowers so sweet the sense faints picturing them thou who thou for whose path the atlantic's level powers cleave themselves into chasms while far below the sea blooms and the oozy woods which were which were the sapless foliage of the ocean know thy voice and suddenly grow grey with fear and tremble and despoil themselves o here so after the impact of the west wind in the atmosphere in the preceding stanza the poem moves on to the stanza 3 where it has west winds impact on hydrosphere so the first one was lithosphere second was atmosphere third was hydros third is hydrosphere here it begins with the words that speak of the blue mediterranean who is personified as a snoozing person in his summer dreams lulled by the sound of its crystalline streams he is sleeping on a pumice island that is made of porous rocks of volcanic eruptions near Baya's Bay in Naples. Now, in the dreams of that personified individual, there are palaces and towers which are quivering in the intense daylight on the surface of the waters. So, this is a pure imagination and they are quivering because what water often quivers and due to that they all the towers and palaces also look quivering all these palaces and towers are overgrown with the blue moss and flowers and these are so abundant and intense that the poet says he can't describe them and that his sense faints amid that intense sweet smell now comes the description of the atlantic which at present is liver powered that is a smooth sea as the west wind starts blowing the smooth surface of the atlantic sea is disturbed and great waves arise in whose casps the wind finds its path so casps because of the the air uh, the chasms are created the chasms are the rifts are created the turbulence on the surface of the atlantic creates disturbance under the surface and there the sea flora which are almost sapless grow gray with fear and trembling they shed their leaves 
this is the visual imagery that Shelley is known for. This stanza, like the earlier two, is uh, very rich in literary devices and visually visual imagery. This too ends with the with the prayer tone over oh, here. Now coming to the stanza number four, if I were a dead leaf, thou mightest bear. If I were a swift cloud to fly with thee, a wave to pant beneath thy power and share. The impulse of thy strength only less free than thou, O uncontrollable, if even I were as in my boyhood and could be. The comrade of thy wanderings over heaven, as then when to outstrip thy ski speed, scarce seemed a vision I would never have striven. As thus with thee in prayer in my sore need, O oh, lift me as a wave, a leaf, a cloud. I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed. A heavy weight of ours has chained and bowed. One, two, like thee, tameless and swift and proud. So in this part of the poem, after describing the impact of the west wind everywhere, the poet expresses the wish if he were a dead leaf, the wind might bear him. Or if he were a swift cloud that the west wind drives with its powers. Or if he were a wave of the ocean that pants beneath the powers of the west wind, he could share the impulse of its strength, which means uh, in other forms, he could have been with the west wind. In such situations, as the sharer of the strength of the west wind, he would partner with it only to a little lesser degree. Since the west wind, in his opinion, is an uncontrollable wild spirit and a divine presence. He expresses his state of childhood or boyhood when as a boy he did not find it impossible to accompany the skied speeds and wanderings of the west wind. Which means that as, as a boy he never felt that it was so difficult to be with the west wind. Even defeating the west wind in its characteristics wasn't impossible that time for him. In, the, in that mindset, in that mindset and in that capacity, the poet says he would have never striven as he strives now in prayer because he is in sore need of this strength. Whereas as a boy, he never felt so. He always felt that he could, uh, he could join the speed of the west wind very easily. There comes the prayer when he urges, Oh, lift me as a wave, as a leaf or as a cloud. And the poet finds himself in perturbing and frustrating situations which he terms as thorns of life he falls on. This fall onto the thorns of life wounds him, injures him and these wounds bleed. This bleeding further takes away the vitality of life and now he is at par with the dead and the decaying leaves or the immobile clouds or the helpless wave, all of whom need the propelling power to create something new. The burdens of life and the consequent frustration with time have bowed and chained the poet. 
the one who once was like the west wind that is in his boyhood he too was tameless tameless that is uncontrollable and swift and proud just like he believes the west wind is so now let's read the stanza number 5 which goes as make me thy lyre even as the forest is what if my leaves are falling like its own the tumult of thy mighty harmonies will take from both a deep autumnal tone sweet though in sadness be thou spirit fierce my spirit be thou me impetuous one drive my dead thoughts over the universe like withered leaves to quicken a new birth and by the incantation of this verse scatter as from an unextinguished hearth ashes and sparks my words among mankind be through my lips to unawakened earth the trumpet of a prophecy o wind if winter comes can spring be far behind so the last line is a very famous line but before this what the speaker says the poet urges the west wind to make him her lyre that is her instrument lyre is a musical instrument that the west wind plays on so as the west wind blows through the forest uh, the poet believes that the sound of trees that shed their leaves and uh, the rustling of the leaves are the musical compositions by by the west wind shally terms the forest in autumn as the lyre of the west wind and the west wind as the musician playing on it he also makes an observation that they both are in the same condition the leaves in the forest are falling and shally himself has been bereft of the vigor of life as a result of the bitterness and harshness of life's burdens he believes that the tumult of the powerful harmonies of the west wind that it creates while rushing through the forest and when it makes the poet its lyre will drive away the dead leaves will take away the autumnal tones on both of them and thereby will revive the spirits to cheerfulness and excitement this is a sweet music despite its sadness shally implores the west wind to let its spirit fears his spirit and he further intensifies the earnest request by telling her to take his shape be thou me he wants to hold in uh, to hold in himself the same characteristic of the west wind of being uncontrollable shally finding his own spirits decaying and suffering now wants the west wind to share its strength with him and drive his dead thoughts away and scatter them over the universe to quicken a new birth he believes that this verse the poem is a half burnt fire from an unextinguished hearth which which has ashes and sparks which are metaphorically these words of reinvigoration he himself has no power of re- revolutionizing the world but the west wind has thus if if takes uh, if it takes these words away like the dead leaves or seed to quicken a new birth and scatter these words among mankind like an incantation 
It will revolutionize the world. He prays the west wind to flow through his lips. That is, to give its power to his lips and voice to wake up the dreaming and sleeping earth to deliver the message if winter comes can spring be far behind. So this is, as I said earlier, that this is the oft quoted line by Shelley which delivers the ultimate optimism in humankind that never fades even in the darkest of times that we must never be so burdened that makes us hopeless. Now let us discuss the structure of the poem. The poem is divided into five parts and each part carries 14 lines. So we can say that each part is a sonnet in itself. But uh, it does not have the structure of a sonnet. The poem is written in terza rima, which is basically an arrangement of triplets, that is three lines, especially in iambic pentameter. Uh, we can say that the perfect example of terza rima was Dante's Divine Comedy. The rhyme scheme of each stanza is A B A. B C B C D C D E D E E. So the uh, each part uh, of the stanza ends with a couplet. This was all about the poem. For the next poem of the syllabus by Shali, please watch the next video of the series. Thank you for your patient listening.